So, obviously, the title, The Boy Crisis, is shocking on its face. What made you decide to sit down and, and write about such an important issue? Well, I was going around the world sort of speaking on my other books on book tours, and um, like people in a uh, teacher in Japan, I remember once came up to me and she said, you know, uh, Dr. Farrell, you know, we have more problems with boys in our class in schools and you know, all over Japan, we're having problems with the boys more than the girls. And, you know, in China, uh, the, you know, the, they were writing about things like, you know, uh, girls up, um, guys down, like as if they were stocks. And um, in Australia, New Zealand, um, Canada. Um, and then I started to see that in uh, all 56 developed nations, um, boys were falling behind girls on um, every single academic subject, especially reading and writing, which are the two biggest predictors of success. And so I said, developed nations, what do developed nations have in common? And I realized that they had in common, they had enough mastery over survival that they could be more, give more permission for two things. One is for divorce, and the other one is for children to be raised by single moms if, they, uh, if a single mom chose to do so. And so I started looking within those two groups of populations and those two demographics, the boys that were having the problems were the ones that were um, children of divorce who had minimal or no contact with their dads. They, if, if children were of divorce, but they had four things happening, that is if they had equal amount of time with the mother and father, if the mother and father lived within about 20 minutes drive time of each other, and if there was no bad mouthing from dad to mom, and both mother and father were attending relationship counseling, the children tended to do reasonably well. But of the ones that had minimal or no contact with their dads, those were the ones that were part of the boy crisis within the divorce group. And the other group were children being raised by single moms. And in the, just to give you some perspective on this, in the United States currently, 53% of women under, under 30 who have children um, have children without being married. Now they, which means the children either don't know who the father is, or they know who the father is, but see them very minimally, or the father and mother do live together when the child is born. But when I looked at that demographic, I found that uh, that 40 percent of those children no longer had much contact or any contact with their dad after four years, um, and so that I saw that the boy crisis resides where dads do not reside. This seemed uh, sad, but I also know, uh, you know, I, I have a PhD in political science and I knew a lot about history. And so I knew that the Moynihan report in 1965 uh, had found that, you know, when they studied inner city crime and uh, why children were having so, so many children were in prison, et cetera, they thought it was going to be about race and blacks, but they found that it was not quite about race and blacks. It was among blacks that there was 25% of the children growing up in African-American families did not have their dads. So it was not among children who were growing up with dads in the African-American community that were having problems. It was children growing up without dads in the African-American community that had problems, that the con controlling factor was fatherlessness or dad deprivation or the lack thereof. And that's where the, the problem resides. Well, that was 25% children growing up in fatherless communities and fatherless homes in 1965. Today, in Caucasian homes, 32% of children are growing up with their, without their dads. And in African-American homes, 75% are growing up without their dads. So you can get some, and, and it's within these demographics of dad-deprived children uh, that the problems are occurring. Uh, now, I began to look at, you know, when I wrote The Boy Crisis, I researched 10 major causes of the boy crisis, and I was, you know, planning my initial book, the book, to be based on these 10 causes. But increasingly, I saw that the that the core hub cause uh, was the dad deprivation and then other causes like um, there being a uh, few male teachers in schools, uh, they were very, those were important causes, but they were secondary. Environmental causes were secondary. Um, mental health causes were, uh, were outgrowths of the dad deprivation. They weren't the cause that the cause was more, the hub of the problem was in the dad deprivation. Now you talk about the purpose void in the book and I found that to be so remarkable in a number of ways, and we'll get into that. But what do you mean by the purpose void? Uh, histor historically, boys have had two senses of purpose. Uh, one was to, they, they, were, they, they were given social bribes to be called heroes, 
uh, to be willing to be disposable in war. And so if you were, you know, if your son was, um, you know, a nice, strong guy, you maybe encourage him to become a Marine to fight against the Nazis in World War II. And, you know, and then if he, even if he died, you didn't want him to die, but if he did die, you know, he, he knew he'd be considered a hero. Uh, maybe he had a f grandfather or an uncle whose picture was on the on the TV or on the radio at that time. And, you know, they, they were, um, you know, and people, you know, the family members praised him because he gave his life in the Marines or in, in war. And so the boy knew that, you know, he could he could be uh, he could be this hero if he was willing to go to war and potentially die. Um, the second group, uh, the second sense of purpose was to be the sole breadwinner. You had to, you know, and I certainly learned this when I was a kid. I, I was good as a writer when I was in, in, in high school, and my father made it really clear to me. Uh, you know, like, Warren, yes, you're a good writer, but do not, uh, you can't become a writer because um, you, only about 1% of writers find a publisher. Um, most people, um, and if you can't find a publisher, you're not going to find a wife. Um, and, you know, so I, I said, well, what's the proof of that? And he said, well, look at Zelda Fitzgerald. <laughs> you know, she, she loved F. Scott Fitzgerald, but she made it real clear um, to F. Scott Fitzgerald that until you have your first best selling book, we don't get married. And so they, um, and so there were enough hints of that that made me realize that you know, that I had to become, I had to not do what I wanted to do. I had not to, I couldn't do what my passion was because if my passion was to be uh, a writer or for other guys, a musician or an artist, uh, that the that the word starving artist um, was <laughs> was around for for a reason, and then you know in Los Angeles there's thousands of people who um, who want to be actors, and they they all have the same name, uh, waiter, and uh, they you know they're sort of um, you know that if you're going to try something that's really creative and that you love and that's your passion, uh, the more fulfilling a job is, the less it pays because the more people are competing to do that work, and so um, so so that was really clear to me, and so boys and men. And we got we got the second uh, the second signal, which is if you want to be eligible as a dad, you have to find you have to do something that's going to pay, that's going to have predictable, dependable income. So not because you love it, but because that's what it will take to support, uh, to attract a woman who wants to have children and to support the wife and children if she decides that she wants to be uh, full time involved with the children or part time involved with the children. And so you know men. We often, and the feminist movement has turned this on its head. And rather than saying thank you, men, for you know going out there and fulfilling this responsibility and obligation to earn money so that the children and and I could be better supported, they said, ah, men earn more money than women for the same work. Not true. What is true is that dads earn more money than women, not for the same work, but but because when they become dads, yeah. they they are more likely to give up doing what they want to do and do what they feel they need to do to support their family. So if they're driving it, if you go outside and you want to go from where you are today to and call it an Uber, the chances are fairly good that about 90% um, of the Uber drivers, well, actually 90% of the Uber drivers are male. Um, they're not doing this because it's about power. They're doing this to be able to either uh, er, to earn enough money to do the things that they need to do in their life. Um, if your garbage is collected in the morning, um, it's not because it's likely to about 99 to 100 percent to be a, a male that's collecting your garbage, not because they feel like getting up at three in the morning in the sleet, snow and rain is about power, um, but because it's about what their obligation is. And so this is some of the you know the the, the distortions that have led to many men being criticized if they don't earn money. And then looked at as being having male privilege and male power if they do earn money. And something that struck me interesting that was in your book is not only are we having that and and in, in, we're here in America, but culturally to any of the first world nations, there was a specific term: two fathers who basically worked themselves to death. Yes, yes, absolutely. There's in Japan. Um, there is um, the, the death from overwork. The name for that is Karoshi, K-A-R-O-S-H-I. And in Japan, they have a game. It's called Mr. Karoshi. And the, 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 the purpose of the game is to try to get your character, Mr. Karoshi, to the top of the ladder as fast as you can to be the first one at the top of the ladder. And the reward for being the first one at the top of the ladder is that you get to commit suicide. <laughs> 
So the, the, the wisdom of the, the youth in Japan is that the normal pathway of becoming a man to try to get to the top of the ladder is a way of committing suicide or doing death from overwork. And so that's, you know, the, and that's one of the reasons that, that many of the young people are not motivated because, you know, they're, um, they're, they, they, they know that that traditional pathway to being a man was that, that men have learned to define power as feeling obligated to earn money that someone else spends while they die sooner. And the young Japanese males are saying, no way. I'm out of that. That's not a ball game I want to play. And they recognize that that is not about power. But um, I want to go back to something that you asked about, about the purpose uh, void. The, the, I was mentioning two senses of purpose that boys traditionally had, which was the uh, warrior or sole breadwinner. Today, we have more, fewer men that are needed in war, and we have fewer men that need to be sole breadwinners because women are helping to share that burden. Um, and so the, uh, but we ha what we have um, is so therefore a purpose void for many men. And the purpose void is actually a wonderful thing if you have a father and a mother that can help guide you to discovering your sense of purpose and then help you to have the discipline to achieve that sense of purpose. But when there is both a purpose void and a dad void, that the boy does not get well guided usually to have that sense of purpose. Moms often are very good at helping the boy discover their, their talents, but what is missing often without dad style parenting added to mom style parenting is the discipline. Dads are far more likely to do boundary enforcement. Boundary enforcement um, encourages postponed gratification. Postponed gratification gives boys the discipline to be able to fulfill their dreams. If a boy has a lot of dreams, or a girl has a lot of dreams, but they don't have the discipline to fulfill it, each time they go about trying to get their dreams, he wants to be an actor, he wants to be a basketball player, he wants to be you know, top notch in school valedictorian, he continues without the discipline, he continues to fail. After a while, he becomes afraid to dream. So he notices that he's not getting um, good feedback from his um, teachers, from his uh, parents are not proud of him in the way they are maybe of his sister or some kid down the block. And the boy feels a bit ashamed when it comes to boy-girl time, the boy starts feeling like, gee, you know, the girls are not dating, uh, they're, they're dating all the winners and, you know, the football players, the student body pres presidents and so on, they're not dating the losers like me. Um, so they, he can't get any satisfaction sexually, so he begins to withdraw into porn uh, because porn is access to a variety of attractive women without fear of rejection at a price he could afford. And so he starts, but the problem with porn, aside from the moral issues, is that he becomes addicted uh, um, his dopamine only becomes stimulated by increasing amount of, about, amounts of doses of more risky behavior with females. And so then he gets to the actual first real life woman and he begins to find that that real life woman is feeling treated like an object because she is. And so she withdraws from him. He feels rejected, returns to porn, and the whole cycle um, continues. And in the meantime, the anger that it festers in this boy if he's a single mom boy, he's usually sensitive. And he then becomes very sensitive to being rejected and, and very angry that girls are not interested in sensitive boys. They're interested in the performers and the winners, uh, not the sensitive boys who are the losers um, from many girls' perspectives. And so, um, and so these types of things create this uh, festering hostility. And, and th then I found that the mass shooters are oftentimes dad deprived boys when i say oftentimes more than 90 percent dad deprived boys because in this boy develops this enormous anger and feeling that nobody pays attention to me and a desire that you know um i'll get people to pay attention to me when i do this shooting people will say i could have prevented that shooting if i had only um, maybe paid a little bit of attention to uh, Nicholas Cruz or Dylan Roof or Elliot Rogers or Adam Lanza, you know, or one of the shooters. Right. And, and I we will definitely get there. I want to just jump back a little bit to this purpose void because two things you, you brought up there. One, you know, this role of the risk taker, the warrior and even the breadwinner 
is mm -hmm. is dying. It's it's evaporating. It's not something that is available to us as society advances with automation. There's less and less risk out there in the workforce. And on top of it, you're seeing pay become more and more equitable. And there are relationships where oftentimes the male is not the sole breadwinner, let alone the, the one who is bringing home the most money. So that's creating this void. And then the other thing uh, I want to touch on is, and, and obviously we're here in Hollywood, so you know, Hollywood is not doing us a service either yeah. in their portrayal of the hopeless, hapless dad who doesn't really have a role other than being the bumbling idiot. And obviously, you know, that's carrying on in, in our minds as, okay, that's the role that a dad has, which clearly is not serving the boys or the, the girls that they're raising. Yes, this, this is a perfect lose-lose situation between, I, I've been with my wife now for 25 years, but uh, 25 years ago when I met her, be, until I met her, between marriages, I was um, dated mostly women who were sing, uh, single mothers. And um, the word I heard most frequently from the single mothers was the word overwhelmed. Uh, they felt they couldn't do anything the way they wanted to. They weren't good. At, they weren't the person at work that they wanted to be. They weren't as good a focused mother as they want to be. So here you have these overwhelmed moms. You have dads who are undervalued and often discarded. Um, you have dads who have to fight for the right to be with the children while women have the right to be with the children. And then you have the children who are suffering from a lack of dad involvement. So there's a, a lose, lose, lose thing happening right now. And, you know, and there's, there's not a sense of um, there being uh, no one understands what exactly dads do that lead to children who have their fathers doing so much better in, get this, more than 60 different areas. Children that have father involvement um, are far more, far less likely to be obese. They're far less likely to have ADHD. They're far less likely to do worse in um, all the, all, every single academic area. Uh, they're far less likely to be depressed, commit suicide. Uh, the suicide rate of boys and girls at the age of nine um, is equal, but between 10 and 14, the suicide rate of boys is twice that of girls. Between 15 and 19, four times that of girls. Between 20 and 25, uh, four and a half times to five times that of girls. Um, and so we are, and, and I could go on and on with the other uh, variables as well. I, uh, the mass shooters, 90% likely to be dad deprived boys. Um, the prisoners, 93% um, males, but of that 93% males, more than 90% are dad deprived. Uh, the ISIS recruits, studies of both male and female ISIS recruits find that both the males and the smaller percentage of females are dad deprived. And so, you know, there's uh, the, the amount of things that happen when a boy uh, or girl is dad deprived are enormous. Girls suffer in most of these areas too, but girls have two, two or three things that boys do not have. They have a same sex role model mm -hmm. and they have much more societal permission to ask for help, to, to cry, to express feelings that boys do not have. And so when boys are in college, for example, 75% uh, of the people who see um, um, psychologists in college and share a suicidal ideation are females. But 75% of the boys, the people in college who commit suicide are boys. Um, and so you know, the, the boys are far more likely as a result of dad deprivation to do the things like committing the suicide or doing things that are destructive. Boys who hurt, hurt us. And this is partially because we, you know, we have not, tr the, the purpose void that we were talking about before, the senses of purpose that boys had in the past was training to be a hero by being disposable. Well, that created heroic intelligence, mm -hmm. Hero but not heroic intelligence was preparation for a short life. Health intelligence is preparation for a long life, preparation to share your feelings, say what's bothering you, not do it often, take, taking the best of masculinity and femininity, you learn to tough it out with as the, the masculine part of you, but you also learn that when the going gets tough, the tough get going sometimes, and other times when the going gets tough, the tough get going to a therapist other times. And you learn that right balance. That's the, that's the balance that keeps you alive, functional, and successful 
uh, the most. But we haven't taught boys emotional skills because what we've depended upon boys in the past for is to be willing to provide money, do what they needed to do to tough it out, or to be willing to die and be disposable. And so those things have created heroic intelligence, not the emotional intelligence and the physical health intelligence that are that will be needed and desired by girls and women in the future because the more money women make, the more they're gonna want emotional intelligence from men in addition to about equal amounts or greater amounts of money. And that's what we were talking about before mm -hmm. we kicked this off. You know, for the last 12 years, we've been working mostly with male clients. We just opened our doors to women and we found that for many of our clients, the first time they realize they're lacking in this emotional intelligence is when they're dating and when they're trying to connect with the opposite sex. And now this emotional intelligence is just going to become more and more in demand. Yes. One question that sort of popped into our mind as we were prepping for the show that's always so fascinating. And, you know, obviously we live in California and, and gun laws are very strict here. And without getting into the politics of gun laws, every time we talk about these mass shootings, you know, it seems like the media focuses on the weapon of choice and does not focus on the perpetrator and what led to that place that he would choose to make that decision. And oftentimes when we talk about the perpetrator, it's he's psychotic, he's a sociopath, he has all these mental illness. Why is it that we're not confronting the root of the issue here that you've been on the forefront and, and why is the media not paying attention to this? Yes, I think it is so much easier to sort of look at the fact that, you know, that the, that the boy um, has a mental illness. Well, duh, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like that's like, you know, that's taught, you know, it's um, redundant. You know, if, if, a, if a person, you know, kills people, they're going to have a mental illness. That's, that's what that's about. Uh, it's just one manifestation of it. Um, if, you know, if we wanted to stop mass shootings, we would do two things. One is the, we would, uh, because more than 90% of the mass shooters are dad deprived, mm -hmm. we would focus on getting dads involved. If you look at the mass shooters, you know, we often say it's about guns, it's about family violence, it's about um, violence on TV or in the media. Uh, well, women have the same access to the same guns, the same access to the same family values, the same access to the same TV, the same access to everything else. They live in the same home. But women are not doing the shootings. Boys are. And it's not all boys that are doing the shootings, obviously. It is more, more than 90% of the time dad-deprived boys. There's two easy solutions to about 99% of the mass shootings. One is dads in, the other is guns out. Yeah. You want, and that accounts for almost all the mass shootings. In Australia, there's practically there used to be about as many mass shootings per capita as there were in the United that there as there was in the United States. They got guns out to a large degree, and um, nothing else changed. But they almost eliminated the mass shootings. In the United States, um, it's it, it, we know now that the mass shootings are among boys who are dad deprived. And there is much more, much easier access to guns than there is in any other place in the world. And we have more mass shootings than any other place in the world, um, I feel, for those two reasons. And so um, the solution is right in front of us. Um, I talked um, last weekend on uh, Sunday to Eric Swalwell, who has a big gun restriction law about this. And, you know, he was saying, saying it's all about guns. I said, no, um, you know, Eric, it is not just all about guns. It is all about, you know, that 90 some odd percent of the mass shootings are about um, a, a dad deprivation as well. And he sort of stopped in his tracks and said, oh, you know, just like his face turned blank and it was like, he hadn't thought of that. And so, um, yeah, that's um, so both of those things have to be considered. Yeah, it seems like a massive blind spot that we have culturally, politically right now to not pay attention to that. To, to go with yeah. that, one of the things that I see on the media when this happens is it's always pointed out and then they're always going to focus on this. The, the he was white and he didn't have uh, he, and he was mentally ill and then there, and there's issues and, and they're acting as if that this sort of thing is not happening in the black community which it is be, but but culturally it comes out it seems to me that it comes out a little bit differently because the hero uh, risk reward in the black community comes out through belong and finding belonging in a in a gang and finding uh, leadership and belonging in that environment so that the the violence it just comes out it, it's still there but it's coming out in a different form yes in the black community the boys who are dad deprived are also much more likely to shoot 
but they don't do mass shootings. They shoot each other. They shoot each other for territory. They shoot each other for drugs, uh, for access to drugs. Um, somebody violates, they, they have a, a group or a territory where there's where they get drugs and therefore they get money. Therefore, they can get cars. Therefore, they can attract women. Mm -hmm. um, and if somebody violates that, uh, they get shot. So blacks kill each other. Uh, with, with whites, and particularly whites in the suburbs, there's expectations on them that are far greater and pressures on them that are far greater than there is in the average um, Af African-American inner city home. And when the boys feel disappointed that they haven't fulfilled the expectations of their parents to be, um, you know, the, the mother, particularly in a single mom family, the mother would usually likely say, sweetheart, you have such sensitivity, you care so much, you're such a wonderful boy. You know, just make, you know, you know make use of that by doing well and doing your homework in school. But because m moms tend to protect more and not uh, enforce boundaries to the same degree, uh, the boy very sweetly figures out a manipulation so she or, so he can um, play a video game or get involved in you know, responding to a text rather than completing homework and then eventually doesn't achieve as much and then begins to feel ashamed and sorry about himself and that creates the withdrawal. I think it's so important for you know, dads to, you know, um, I started to see what I, when I was doing the research for the boy crisis, that there's about nine differences between dad style parenting and mom style parenting. And dad style parenting um, is more like this. I'll give you an example. Um, dads and moms will set boundaries exactly the same way. They'll both say things like, um, you know, sweetie, you can't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. Uh, kids test the boundaries in the same way. Uh, they go, uh, some like, you know, um, can I have, uh, I had some peas now, can I have some ice cream? And, um, and, 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 de and moms will usually respond by saying, sweetie, I said you couldn't have your ice cream until you finish your peas. But mom's thinking to herself, but I'm not going to get into a huge argument over a few peas. I'll tell you what, sweetie, mm -hmm. finish half the half the peas, then you can have your ice cream. Um, so now the kid realizes I can manipulate a better deal. So he finishes half of the half of the peas and mom <laughs> thinks to herself, well, you know, he tried. Okay. And so the kid knows there's what I can do at any time. Um, 25%. I got my mom cl right, cleared. Show the effort and, and you're good. <laughs> I showed the effort that you're good. Um, he tried. Okay. Um, with dad, it's like, excuse me, we've got a deal here. The deal is you you know, get your ice cream until you finish your peas. You know the deal. I know the deal. You know that I know the deal. Uh, oh, you're so mean. Mom's not like that. You can continue whining. There'll be no ice cream tomorrow night either. Oh, man. But now what does the boy do or girl do? They have no choice but to finish the ice cream, to finish the, um, the, the peas before they get the ice cream. So they end up finishing the peas. Now you look at the analysis of what the outcome of that is. Uh, children raised predominantly by dads, only 15% of them have ADHD. Children raised predominantly by moms, 30% have ADHD. If you look at that example with the mom, the child doesn't learn to focus his attention on what he has to do in order to get what he wants to do. So, so he doesn't learn attention focus, he learns attention deficit. He learns to manipulate and be coercive. So mothers find themselves much more likely to describe themselves, single mothers, far more likely to describe, to describe themselves as overwhelmed, exhausted, and coerced by their children, far more likely to be um, uh, victims, feel like they're victims of a child that is rebellious and shouting at them and b almost bullying them. Um, dads are much less likely to describe that type of behavior when they're the primary parent. Um, and so the, but the most important aspect of what I just described was the teaching of the child postponed gratification. Um, and so the, the that child with the dad is learning, to, I can't have what I want, the ice cream, until I do what I need to do. That's the behavior that's taken to school to do the, um, you know, to become successful. Um, the postponed gratification, as we all know, is the single biggest predictor of success. And so, and boys who are successful um, are honored, they're appreciated by everyone, and they don't feel a need to drift off into video game addiction and so on. Uh, and so that's, um, but I'll give you another one more example that it's really more fun. Um, one of the dynamics between moms and dads 
is roughhousing. Um, dads will tend to sort of take the three kids and throw them on the couch, and the game is, okay, the three of you, um, your job is to jump onto my back and turn me over and pin me down um, in a wrestling match before I pin the three of you down together. Okay. Yeah, we got it. Yeah, we got it. Um, and they, <laughs> in, the, in the meantime, mom is, um, you know, looking on and she's going, oh my God, I feel like I have just one more child to monitor. Um, but, mom is saying, <laughs> but, but mom is saying to herself, oh, okay, now, now be good. The kids are having fun. Um, you don't want to interfere. You don't want to be, you know, you want your dad to get, get, get involved, but she's also fearing that sooner or later there's going to be somebody crying or somebody going to get hurt. Well, she's only about 99.9% likely to be right. <laughs> and yeah. um, sooner or later, somebody gets hurt and it's crying. And so now mom's thinking to herself, all right, now dad's going to learn his lesson. He won't do this roughhousing anymore. Um, but dad doesn't learn his lesson. He says to the children, uh, you know, um, Jimmy or Jane, you can't stick your elbow in your sister's eye um, <laughs> in order to win at roughhousing. <laughs> You've got to, you know, do what you can use leverage. You can fake the person out. Uh, you can do you can, you can do this and that, but not this. Uh, okay, Dad. Okay, we got it. Um, okay, now go back and try again. Um, and so the kids go back, and um, they, uh, but they violate the, the in what they call what psychologists call um, the uh, getting emotional intelligence under fire. They all want to agree with what Dad is uh, um, is suggesting or requiring. But when they get excited, they forget about their sisters and, and brothers' needs, and they just push and, and get to to what they want to do. So then Dad stops if he's a good dad and says, "Okay, um, I warned you. Now there's no more roughhousing. Oh, we forgot that. We forgot. Nope, no more roughhousing until tomorrow night." Now, the, so Mom is looking at this and going, "Wait a minute! You didn't learn the lesson. The kids cried. Then they you told them what to do." Then they didn't get it again, and you're still roughhousing and promising more tomorrow night. You are, in fact, a child I have to monitor. <laughs> what dad doesn't explain is that tomorrow night is where, what it's all about. Tomorrow night, he says the same thing, and if the children violate the, the agreement, there's no roughhousing tomorrow night. But usually the children tomorrow night don't violate the agreement because the children have learned that when they don't consider their sisters or brothers' needs, they don't get their needs met. They don't get to do what they want to do. They don't get the excitement uh, of, of the roughhousing. So they're, uh, so for the with the dad giving up, pushing their sister or brother aside is worth it because if they don't do that, they lose what they want. So now the studies of, the, of children roughhousing with dads show children are more likely to be empathetic. Well, I've never heard a dad say to a mom, <laughs> um, you know, I, I'd like you to let me roughhouse because this will teach the children empathy. And if he did, it's like, what? Empathy seems pretty counterintuitive to roughhousing. But you can see it's not the roughhousing per se that creates the empathy. It's the roughhousing re combined with the boundary enforcement and the requirement that there will be no more roughhousing if you don't think of somebody besides yourself. The same with the assertiveness versus aggressiveness. The second or third time around, the kid may say, well, you know, I, I didn't push him or, or her. And then dad is able to say, that's what pushing is. That's to, that's where the assertiveness became the aggressiveness. Not in those words, but you can't push that way, that hard, that type of thing. Well, mom can say that intellectually a hundred times. Dad could say it intellectually a hundred times, but the child doesn't learn it until she or he experiences right, it. Right, it's the experience. And so that's... That's what teaches the difference between being assertive and aggressive. So now we have the data to show that children who roughhouse form a bond with their dad. The bond allows the dad to set the boundaries and enforce the boundaries without there being resentment because that bond is so strong, kids know that they're going to go back to the roller coaster and they also um, and, and get the boundaries enforced and they're going to have a lot of fun. So they want to play, they want to play the game with dad. Whereas mom will be more likely to repeat the command over and over again. Moms will tell me, you know, I really feel sort of upset in a way uh, that dad can say something once and the kids will do it. 
I have to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And I, you know, I spend the more time with the kids than the dads do, and yet I'm the one that has to repeat things over and over again. Why is that? And the reason that it is is because a repetition of a requirement without a consequence is not enough. Tells the kids, I might as well go ahead and continue doing pushing my sister aside uh, or being aggressive because you know. I can handle a little dis. I can handle a little verbiage from my mom. I can just ignore that and go on, be passive aggressive about it. Yes, mom, do anything you want. Yeah. Go back and do what I really want, what I want. Um, and so that's sort of like um, you know a, a typical. This is just one example of nine different styles that dads have versus moms have. And what I'm encouraging dads to do, I'm not blaming dads for not sharing this with moms. I don't know of any parenting magazine that explains this. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm not blaming moms either because moms can't hear what dads don't say. Well, this 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 one piece with the rough housing and, and how it is creating this bond and building this respect between the father and the children. Look at the building blocks that this puts together for now. Now the child goes to school and they're in the schoolyard and now they're trying to put together diplomacy in order to put some games together, to play some football, to play some soccer. And with those skills, they're able to put teams together, set the rules, have this game. And now these children are forming these bonds on their own. And now they feel safe because they're, they have the acceptance and the approval and the attention of their peers and now they're for good without that skill they're going to be left out of that schoolyard and now because there has been these children we were finding gym and pt time is being taken from schools because there are some kids who are unable to build these blocks and now we have to take it so they're going to go how far we were just talking about this of diplomacy and this leadership and this emotional intelligence and they're not even finding out about this sometimes it comes to dating sometimes it's even later to when they're in finally in a position at in work and in a career on the top of a team and they're unable to put it and together they're lost and the other part that we were laughing about you know both of us grew up uh, with our dads, single dad for me, dad divorced, mom was out of the picture, she was abusive. And you know, Johnny chose to live with his dad after divorce. And outside of the, that angle, we also developed this resilience, right? This mm -hmm. grit that dad enforces. And I always felt that, you know, if there was a boo-boo, if I went to any of the women in my household, I would be treated in a much different manner yes. than if I had a boo-boo with dad. And, yes. you know, that style of parenting is often frowned upon, right? Dads get yelled at for these behaviors saying, what's your problem? Why are you letting them beat up on each other, hurt each other, and not understand the underlying uh, importance of these activities to build the grit, resilience, and diplomacy and leadership that it takes to excel in your career. So now we're, we're raising children who are getting to a place of they're feeling lost, the parents are exasperated, and often they don't share in the dynamic at all. Uh, they're getting upset with each other. And we talked about violence. We're also seeing at the other end with the drug epidemic and the opioid crisis and, mm -hmm. and children just withdrawing from society and not having any purpose or meaning in their life. You're, you're absolutely right. And if you take it right back to what you were talking about, John and AJ, about the building blocks, the building blocks that we just described with the, the um, rough housing, you take those building blocks to school and you know who are the kids going to like more at school? The person who shows some empathy, the person who knows the difference between being assertive versus aggressive, or the one that is not empathetic, that is self-centered, that it does that is aggressive. And of course, the it's a rhetorical question. Children want children will associate with children that are more empathetic, and that ch children that are uh, know the difference between being assertive versus aggressive. And so, th therefore, those children end up having more friends. Children with more friends end up with better social skills, emotional skills, and, and and there's a whole cycle of you know building on that friendship. But they're much more likely to be less depressed. They're more likely to sort of do, uh, feel good about themselves, succeed in school, have the energy to complete things if they have the postponed gratification as well. And so you have a much happier child. The withdrawal, the anger, the anger, the hood over the head, the um, you know the the taking of drugs, the being able to be seduced into doing something destructive. Um, you know, boys who don't have their testosterone can uh, channel constructively, uh, usually by a dad and mom together, will almost invariably channel their testosterone destructively. 
this is why you have to have uh, about an equal amount of fathers, uh, sorry, male and female teachers in school, at least as many male teachers in the grammar school for second, third grade. When you have children going from mother only homes to female only schools, and then you ask, why did that boy get attracted to a drug dealer? Why did he get attracted to a gang leader? Well, he's looking for structure. He's looking for mm -hmm. leadership, he's looking for respect. And he needs to get that respect constructively, not destructively, to wonder why he's attracted to some type of form of authoritarian figure. Um, Hitler, we, we have known this for a long time. Hitler youth sought for Hitler youth. Dad deprived boys because the boys that needed searched for some type of father figure to give them um, guidance. And so we, we, as I said before, the Moynihan report, we saw this, the Coleman report, we saw this over and over again, we have seen this effects of dad deprivation and yet no one is paying attention. When I was talking to the Democratic, I went to Iowa this weekend to talk to 11 Democratic candidates about this issue. And you know, a few of them like John Hickenlooper and, um, and um, Andrew Yang uh, were, you know, were very responsive, and yes. so was Tim Rand. Um, but the, uh, but, but a, a number of them sort of like looked at me like, what? You know, yeah, boys having a problem? No, no, boys will become men. Men are the dominant force in society. They don't have a problem. Uh, you know what? Um, you know, dad deprivation. What do you mean, dads? You know, lack of dads. Um, no, I don't think that's an issue. We want women to have uh, the right to raise children by themselves if they want to. We don't want to bring that issue up as our issue. Um, and so, you know, if, you know, if, if Democrats and liberals consider this. Um, don't understand this issue, um, they're going to be losing a lot politically because many, many fathers and mothers who have children that have problems um, want some candidate. They feel ashamed that their children have problems. They're afraid to speak about these issues. They need a candidate either on the political left or the political right that says, I understand that boys are having problems. I understand that there's a need for dads. Um, and then they'll, most people care more about their son than they care about a party label. We lightly touched on this with the, the porn problem that you were talking about earlier, but this is not just porn. We're looking at this dopamine system yes. that is being manipulated and a lot of us aren't even aware of it. It's invisibly happening with these devices in our pocket and all of these distractions that are wiring our brains for behavior that is not healthy. And you talk about this in the book that this inhibited, this inhibited dopamine function in the brain leads to a cascade of issues for, for boys and girls. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about that because I know it's been a, something that Johnny and I have talked about a lot on the on show, the show. Yeah. and I don't think enough people realize it. Absolutely. John Gray, who um, is the author of the book um, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, um, he did five chapters in the Boy Crisis book on ADHD and how to prevent it and he's um, and without using drugs. Uh, the drugs are just, you know, it's like they're like crutches that um, that many of the drugs are very similar to cocaine and other um, really negative drugs that, that will solve the problem for a while, um, but will increase the problem. And um, af after a while with the, you know, for the reasons you just mentioned, uh, what can be done, though, is, uh, you know, five chapters worth of solutions to this, uh, mostly ideally preventive solutions, but also you can reverse ADHD and um, exercise is the number one way of reversing ADHD. But that doesn't mean suggesting to your children that they exercise. It means requiring your children to exercise. Uh, when I was, you know, um, bringing up um, our daughters, and um, and you know, our daughters said they didn't want to play soccer, and I, you know, made a, I had a dialogue with the mom and said, nope, this is not a, this is not an option. You don't have to play soccer but you have to do something physical, um, some type of team sport, learn how to interact with other children, get your body physically moving. Well, for girls, that's important. For boys, that's even more important because boys' brains are more receptive. They're, they're, more, um, they're more settled down. They're more cooperative when they have physical activity. Um, Michael Gurian is very good at, at this, uh, knowing the differences between the way boys and girls' brains operate. Um, and so um, and is there, he's training um, different schools and different teachers uh, to understand these, these differences. And so we, we need to get that type of um, training um, happening with um, and, and knowing what prevents um, 
this um, the the carbs, the propensity for carbs and sodas. Uh, these are all things that are poison to the brain that reinforce ADHD. Uh, the impact of, um, um, of, of of hot baths and many other things that are so many things can be done to reverse ADHD. And so, if your son has ADHD, take a look um, at at those five chapters in the Boy Crisis book. Um, the other thing that's so important uh, for the the correct dopamine balance is family dinner nights. We've all heard that family, the children that do better are ones that have a lot of family dinner nights. But I've seen that there's a refinement of that. Uh, there are family dinner nights and there's also family dinner nightmares. And so as I began to start, <laughs> as I began to start interviewing families, I began to see that there's about five things that families do that lead to family dinner nights being extremely constructive and if they're not done, they can become extremely destructive. And so one of those, for example, is knowing how to make sure that there are no electronics at the table. Um, some parents come up to me and say, you know, Dr. Farrell, you know, my children, they always want electronics at the table. Um, you know, I don't know how to get rid of them. Well, I know something immediately when the, the parent says that, which is that the parent is in charge of the children, not the, uh, that the children are in charge of the parent, mm -hmm. not that the parent is in charge of the children. We're laughing They're, just thinking about that. If we told our dads, no, the iPad stays at the oh, dinner table. He, there's no way. <laughs> Talk about a boundary. Well, it yep, even, yep. to even go along with that, my dad had this thing in this, and I was laughing about this, Warren, because when, in, during summer vacation, if I was home playing computer games, I was in trouble. But if I was out mm -hmm. skateboarding, my dad didn't care where I was, what I was doing, as long as I was out and skateboarding, he was fine. But if he came home and I was in playing video games, in front of, it was... It, he would find chores for me to do. So I learned very quickly that let's find yeah, some where the reward is. is. It's not in front <laughs> of the computer. Yeah. So <laughs> it was, and that was how he went about making sure that I was outside playing and not behind uh, uh, the computer screen. My dad hid the Sega Genesis. Yeah. I was all excited. I <laughs> invited my friends over. I had the Mortal Kombat code so I could see all the blood and violence. And I go into my bedroom with my buddies and there's no Sega. And I'm like, what the hell? And my dad's like, no, you've been playing this too much. Get outside, grab outside. a basketball, do something. But I find that, you know, parents right now are, are so protective of their children being injured and, and getting mm -hmm. into this rough housing and going outdoors is, is almost anathema to yeah. being a parent these days. It's like, no, we want to keep our kids close and monitoring. Save. We need this device on them so I know where they are. And it's just fostering this dopamine dysfunction that we're talking about. Yes, you're absolutely right. Here's an example of particularly in divorce, there's a lot of misunderstandings that happen this way. And these are genuine misunderstandings. So for example, a dad will have the children, let's say he only has the children during the weekend, and it's Sunday. And on the Sunday, there's a good NFL game. Um, and so the the dad, um, the, the kid says, you know, can I go to the, um, the to the playground and uh, pick up a game? Dad goes, yeah, no problem. And so the kid goes to the playground, uh, you know, be careful or whatever. Uh, but the kid goes to the playground, picks up a game, and maybe the kid gets into a fight um, with the kids that, you know, that he hangs out with at, on the playground. And so the kid comes home um, after a fight, maybe has a black eye or some sort of remnant from that fight. And the um, and and then, and then mom picks him up um, and says, you know, how did you get that black eye? How did you get that bruise, that scrape, whatever? <laughs> and they said at the playground. Uh, well, why wasn't your dad there? Oh, he was watching an NFL game. So now mom <laughs> is convinced two things: that a dad has no consciousness of safety and protection for the child. A, B, the dad cares more about an NFL game um, or, you know, the finals in a basketball um, tournament uh, than he does about his son um, and convincing him, convincing her that it's really dangerous to leave the child with the dad. Uh, whereas dad doesn't articulate and say to him, uh, to her, what is going on in his mind? And for most dads, it's something like this. If the child goes to the playground and gets into a fight, 
and I come back and the child comes back and is, uh, uh, it's apparent that he or she has been in a fight. Then I talk to the child about, you know, what created the fight? Uh, what was your first red flag? You know, who, do, who, who did you talk to? Um, you know, did you um, maybe you played a pickup game of basketball and one of the kids pushed another kid aside. Well, is that a red flag of the type of kid you do or don't want to be playing with? Maybe they offer you a little few years later. Maybe they offer you a drink. Is that a red flag of somebody you do or don't want to be playing with? The dad would rather have the kid get beaten up, not badly beaten up. Nobody wants the children badly beaten up, but pushed around or maybe beaten up and then be able to come home and then talk about what happened. And then so that the child has a support system to know what are the red flags that prevent me from getting into trouble in the future. Dad does not want the child to grow up and be and ha not have that type of information and that type of experience. Dads feel that if you protect a child too much, you're leaving a child unprotected uh, for life. And so, but dads, again, don't explain that to moms and moms can't hear what dads don't say. And even when dads do explain it to mom, moms, moms often think the dads are crazy and just making up an excuse um, to not um, pay attention to the child to a greater degree. Um, but so this has to all be, you know, uh, I put this in the boy crisis because there is this information, this, this way of thinking about what I call checks and balance parenting. The best, the children that grow up the best are not ones that have just dads or just moms. They're ones that have a, an active tension between dads and moms around how much protection, how little protection. Uh, when can my son or daughter climb the tree? If so, they can. if they can climb the tree at a younger age than mom would like, what type of protection do they need when they climb the tree? Do they need dad out there to sort of make sure they don't fall and really hurt themselves? Does dad need to be out there with or without a, um, a cell phone? Um, when we, you know, when we talk about these issues on family dinner night, what makes that family dinner night into a family dinner nightmare? And one of the things that makes that family dinner night into a family dinner nightmare is not having each person in the family be fully listened to, no matter what their opinion, no matter what they say, no matter how they say it. The first job of every family member is to allow each person in the family, children and parents, to feel completely heard by the other one. So you create what I call the e pluribus unum experience. E pluribus meaning that every person in the family, pluribus is heard. And unum, that when everyone is heard, you feel the, the, uni, the unification of the most important phenomenon that human beings have invented, a, fa a united family. Now, it is Father's Day in celebration of Father's Day. What can we do? as parents, whether it's dad, mom, or to support, obviously, growing children that are healthy. And I know for a lot of us, we're starting out as parents, we're, we're thinking about children, and we want to be the best parents. Maybe we've learned some things from our parents that we don't want to do. How can we show up and, and be better parents? The number one thing that parents can do is, um, is learn how to handle personal criticism without becoming defensive. Um, get to, you know, I started teaching couples communication courses around the country because I found that when, uh, you know, d b the boy crisis was oftentimes a phenomenon of divorce. Divorce was a phenomenon of uh, the mother and father not being able to handle uh, criticism without becoming defensive. Therefore, it made it unsafe for their partner to be able to share their real feelings and concerns. And so both sexes felt, both mom and dad felt like they were walking on eggshells. And so that would either lead to a divorce or sure. it would lead to a legal divorce or it would lead to a psychological divorce or it would lead to a minimum security prison marriage, which um, <laughs> which is which is very sad for everybody. Yes. And so I started teaching that. But it's important not to, I teach it to adults. Uh, it's very important for parents to have that because most of the time children mimic the style of communication sure. that their parents that their parents do. That's pretty common sense. But it's also important for us to be teaching that to our first, second, and third grade children, both boys and girls. Uh, so the bully, 
bullies that see that that are picking on a kid when they see what the feelings and the and the the real full personality of the child that they're picking on and how that made them feel they stop they stop bullying to a much greater degree when the bully when the bully is listened to as well he or she doesn't feel as insecure and therefore bullies less the bully and the bullied have in common, both of them have low self-esteem. They have a lot of characteristics in common. And as they listen to each other in first, second, and third grade, where this has been done in Denmark, they find that there's a significant reduction in bullying in school and also other dysfunctional behavior. And there's an increase in emotional intelligence uh, that you were talking about before, AJ, as being so crucial, not only to getting along with children, but eventually in you know male-female relationships or in same-sex relationships relationships, um, emotional intelligence is probably the, the most important single skill you can get. And the fact that we're teaching, you know, I, I have learned far more from teaching the couples communication courses than I ever learned, um, even though I was, uh, I was good enough at math to be teaching math in the eighth grade, but I haven't learned nearly as much from math as I have from couples communication skills and communication skills. Absolutely. And we, we love to wrap every episode with a uh, challenge for our listeners and with it being father's day we love the exercise you outline in the beginning of your book inquiring about your dad's glint yes could you walk our listeners through this exercise so that they could do it as well i can do a mini version of that absolutely so um if you're listening to this um just close your eyes for a moment and just visualize a time in your life when you saw your dad with a glint in his eye. By glint in his eye, I mean he wasn't worried about lecturing you, correcting you, telling what you were doing right or wrong. He didn't seem to be worried about anything. For those few minutes, maybe he was telling a joke he told a, t a dozen times before or a story he told a dozen times because he knew that when he told that story or that joke, he would feel like people would laugh at him and that relaxed him and he knew exactly how to tell it. Or maybe he golfed, or maybe he fished, or maybe he sang in a chorus, or maybe he played a musical instrument, or maybe you didn't ever see that glint in his eye, but you saw it in a picture of your father when he was just on a honeymoon um, with your mom, um, and and the, the glint in his eye you could see in that picture. Maybe you didn't know your dad. So if you didn't know your dad, imagine what might have created the glint in his eye. So maybe it came from cooking or flying a plane around sunset and just feeling the poetic, emotional power of that. So when you capture the glint in your father's eye, compare that with what your father actually did for a living. So if you're saying, well, my father, you know, I, I, he had a glint in his eye when he cooked turkey for Thanksgiving. So he became a chef. So he did for a profession what created the glint in his eye. No, that's not the same. When he was cooking for Thanksgiving, the glint in his eye came because he was cooking for his family. When he was a chef, he was cooking on Thanksgiving and he was away from his family. What you do as a profession, you do what needs to be done. You don't do what creates a glint in the eye. And so I'll ask you to imagine when you're when you're the first child in your family was born, your mom and dad thinking, you know, we know how many children we want. And should we do something that created the glint in your eye? Should you just do more fishing, more playing with the children, more, um, more making things in the garage that you are creative, more being singing in the chorus and at, at church? Or should you do what you actually did for a living? Which would make more money? doing what created the glint in his eye or doing what he actually did for a living, maybe selling insurance or whatever. The chances are the selling insurance did not create the glint in his eye. He may have been proud of what he did, but if you really searched for the glint in his eye, you would have found something else that created more of a glint for him. And most of our dads, when our children were, when the children were born, gave up the glint in their eye, the true glint, and did something that, that they liked doing less. They loved education, 
but they gave up being a teacher because they knew they'd make more money as a superintendent of schools, as a principal or as an assistant principal, or selling product X to place Y. They gave up selling locally because they could make more money managing uh, a national sales, being a national sales rep. So as you look at what dads did, your dad did to on Father's Day, think about what created the glint in his eye and maybe ask your dad if he's still alive. Dad, what created the glint in your eye and direct him toward helping him discover his own glint? I had one person at a workshop become angry at me because I suggested this and he said to his father, you know, dad, I want to know what creates the glint in your eye. And his dad ripped him apart for going to these Warren Farrell type of new age workshops um, <laughs> where, you know, oh, you want to find out what the glint in your eye is? Well, very nice. And he said, you know, when you become a man, John, you're going to do what you need to do, not what you're going to learn what you need to do, not what you want to do. Um, and so he was furious at me. And then he saw his dad a few minutes later start to cry. And he said, Dad, you know, I haven't, what, what's happening here? And he had never seen his dad cry except when his mom had died. And he, and he was really scared. And he said to his dad, what's happening? And he said, I guess I thought nobody would ever care enough to ask. That's the gift you can give your dad on Father's Day. I have, you know, that's, I've given you a little synopsis of that. But if you want to know more about how to, how to direct that and how to, how to, how to work out what a glint is and, how to distinguish that and how to ask that question. Um, so I have a whole section on that, as you know, in the, in the boy crisis. And where can our audience find more about the book and everything that you're working on in these fantastic workshops? If you, um, if money is an issue, um, then I'd suggest Amazon, which has it at a 30 some odd percent discount. So, um, if you're a, a guy or a woman who drives a lot or you, works out at the gym, it's an audible forum. Uh, it's also now in paperback or hardcover. Um, so Amazon is definitely the least expensive place to get it. Um, if you're if you have a bit more income and you can afford to buy it at a, a local store, support your local bookstore um, uh, for uh, for the Boy Crisis book. And if you want to know more about it, um, you can look at WarrenFerrell.com. That's my website, and it's not um, Ferrell like Will Ferrell. It's <laughs> And we'll link it up in the show notes. I've, I haven't been making you laugh, so you know it's not real, Pearl. <laughs> different podcast episode. Yeah. Yeah, Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. It's, it's been a pleasure for me, too. You guys are just wonderful. 